Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, webinar today, and especially welcoming you all on this rather eventful day. Um, so I'm very glad to see you all here um, in, this, in this context. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Melanie Tanilian. I'm the director of the Center for Armenian Studies at the University of Michigan. And before we begin with today's webinar, I would like to thank Naira Tumanian, who has worked tirelessly these last months to keep our program running in the context of a global pandemic, an extremely difficult national political atmosphere, and now, of course, a nearly unresolved election and a war that is devastating the region of Nagorno-Karabakh. As many of you know, the international nonprofit organization Genocide Watch has issued a genocide emergency alert, and so has the International Association of Genocide Scholars due to Azerbaijan's aggression against the Armenian Republic of Artsakh. This alert was followed by the UN High Commissioner of, for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, on Monday, saying that indiscriminate attacks on populated areas in and around the conflict zone contra uh, contravened international humanitarian law, or in other words, constitute war crimes. It is a devastating situation that we find ourselves in, and I'm sure we only know that a fraction of might, might be the reality on the ground as a moratorium on international journalists, combined, of course, with an ambivalence of the international community, as well as a distraction of the international community, really has obscured our view. So I'm urging you, everyone who's watching or listening, to continue to raise awareness, don't get tired, to continue to calling your congressional representatives to urge the United States government to condemn, condemn the Azerbaijan's atrocity against Armenians and to demand a stop to the attacks to prevent a repeat of the war that cost the lives of tens of thousands in the 1990s. The current war has its roots in that moment which marked the end of an empire, as the Soviet Union crumbled in the 1980s, the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh sought independence, a desire that was crushed and yet that brutal war. It is the material remnants of the Soviet empire in ruins uh, that are the subject of today's talk for which we welcome Dr. Lori Khachadurian. And I would like to express my extreme gratitude to Lori for being here today, especially on a day when I'm sure many of us had little sleep in the last 24 hours. Dr. Khashadurian is an associate professor at Cornell University's Institute of Archaeology and Material Studies. She is also a Michigan alumni, and we are very excited to have her back, even if only virtually. She has published numerous articles about archaeological practices in the South Caucasus and beyond. So we're returning to the South Caucasus yet again this year, this, this evening. And uh, she has published uh, many pieces, including a forthcoming piece in Near Eastern Archaeology titled Education Beyond Preservation, an Archaeological Camp for Girls in Armenia and Objects in Crisis, Curation, Repair, and the Historicity of Things in the South Caucasus, published as part of a Cambridge University Press edited volume on social th theory in archaeology and ancient history. Her Michigan PhD in classical arts and archaeology resulted in Dr. Hachadurian's first monograph, Imperial Matter, Ancient Persia and the Archaeology of Empires, a work that employs the term satrapy as it became part of the public's rhetorical repertoire in the post-Cold War period to investigate how the material world shaped imperial sovereignty. The long history of Persian political philosophy that is attached to the term satrapy opened a space for Dr. Hachadurian to argue that things, large and small, those that are considered meaningful and of course those that are considered meaningless shaped the social and political life under the imperial umbrella. Her new project continues to probe the power of the material, this time in the remnants of empire or what Anne Stoller has referred to imperial debris. Dr. Khachadurian's talk today, today, Life Extempore, Trials of Ruination in Armenia's Soviet Factories, is an introduction to a larger project of archaeological and ethnographic research initiated by her in 2017. 
The project at large considers the afterlives of, afterlives of socialist modernity in both urban and rural areas of post-Soviet Armenia. The Soviet factories that form the ethnographic and archaeological sites for Dr. Khachaturian's inquiry are the remnants of a process of aggressive industrialization that thrust Armenia headlong into the age of high modernity and from afar might easily be seen in her word as simply the industrial carcasses of a failed utopian socialist and capitalist projects. They are bodies of ruin that remind but are now devoid of life and economic activity. However, as we will see today, a closer look facilitated by interviews, participant observation, and the material analysis within the decomposed, decommissioned um, uh, factories reveals an afterlife that is aimed at making a living under ruination. Dr. Khachadurian's multifaceted investigation draws back the heavy curtain of industrial debris to highlight, I quote her, multi-species forces of contemporary ruination, from the human who plundered the derelict factories or dwell and work within them, to the plants and animals that repopulate them, to the elements that erode and oxidize them, to the toxic chemicals that pollute and sometimes even explode them." End of quote. It is the story in Dr. Hachadurian's word of an assisted decay, an involuntary decay, perhaps a suspended decay, as well as a curated decay. And it's also a story of perpetual extemporization and improvisation that animates the steel, iron, and concrete skeletons of the not so distant socialist past. And with this short introduction, I will turn over the screen to Dr. Khachadurian and welcoming her to virtual Michigan. Thank you so much, Melanie, for the kind invitation uh, to be with you today and for that introduction. I'm also grateful, let me just get my technology working for me here. Okay. I'm also grateful to all who are tuning into this webinar, wherever you may be, particularly those of you whose mental and emotional energies are consumed by the war in Nagorno-Karabakh which is to say virtually the whole of Armenian studies. While, while I will not be speaking about the war today, I do want to acknowledge the calamity that's unfolding and the immense pain it's causing. The work I'll be sharing, as Melanie said, is part of a, a book project on life in the ruins of modernity in Armenia. This project contributes to the growing turn to ruins in anthropology, archeology span and cultural geography. And indeed the work sits at the intersection of these fields. Archeology, span my home discipline has become increasingly aware of its epistemological and ethical role in the study of 20th century ruins from the remnants of genocide and colonialism to the debris of war and industry. And it's the last of these, the remnants of Soviet industry that is my focus today. So let me share my screen. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we'll turn our attention to some of the challenges that Armenians face, challenges that are like the Nagorno-Karabakh war, in large part, the detritus of the Soviet experiment. It was the deer that first caught my attention. Set in a window socket in a metal processing factory in Gyumri, Armenia, was a nonsensical socialist realist collage that de depicted the animal flipped, its hooves pointing upwards. Nearby, a distorted hammer and sickle and the severed wrist of a heroic worker came into view. I had come to learn how value is created and lost from Soviet machines and buildings undergoing slow, irreversible decay. And it was this pragmatic iconoclasm that spoke most poignantly to the ways in which ruination turns worlds upside down and summons people into unlikely projects of improvisation. The owner of the factory told me that when the 1988 Spitak earthquake shattered the plant's windows, workers sectioned, spliced, and shuffled a patchwork of factory art to board up the gaping holes. 
it was a portent of things to come. In the next decade, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the ensuing decimation of Soviet industry enjoined the former proletariat into lives of constant extemporization and everyday struggles with things in decay. Today, the owner of the metal processing factory is engaged in an unrelenting contest, particularly with trees, to forestall ruination in order to draw the material remnants of socialist in industry into relations of capital. He routinely patches holes in walls and repairs a decaying roof that exposes machines to precipitation and threatens collapse on his two-man crew. As a growing body of research documents industrial modernity's destructive effects, it is all too easy to occlude the strenuous projects at the margins of global capitalism that seek to retain industrial lifeways and make a living off of the very ruination that animates contemporary critique. Such projects are my focus today. Like other anthropologists, I'm concerned to understand what it means to live a life in ruins specifically in the heavy, metallic, unyielding ruins of Soviet industry. I'm finding that this requires a new vocabulary of terms that I will lay out here at the start and will use throughout my talk. Livelihood practices in ruins are marked by what I call trials of ruination. I use the term to refer to the contests or struggles that surround steadfastly hard matter in decay, concrete steel and the machinic material culture of industrial life. These trials entail many forces and energies, human and non-human. In the example you see here, for instance, a factory owner and a raspberry bush were engaged in a trial. Despite his best efforts to clear the vigorous plant off the truck, it has simply defied his containment efforts. He has relinquished the Ural 375, once a workhorse of the Soviet army, to a berry bush. Plants are significant actors in the trials of ruination, but they are not my focus today. I just really like this example, so I never miss a chance to share it. Instead, today I explore the economics of these trials. In an economic sense, trials of ruination are the practical struggles to unlock or forego the salvage value of material things in decay. In economics, salvage value or residual value is an operation undertaken by firms to account for the highest exchange value of an old asset after depreciation generated by sale for future use or scrap. Salvage value is the stuff of accountancy and balance sheets. Anthropologically, I'm concerned less with formulaic estimations than human thing relations entailed in unlocking value, either from the exchange of such undead assets or alternatively attempting to forego reaping salvage value in order to put to use capital goods in their senescence. Now these terms of capitalist economics are imperfect. While they introduce the phenomena under view, they also risk obscuring the dissonance entailed in the transfiguration into capitalist commodities of things once belonging to a planned economy in which production, wages, and prices were regulated by the state. As will become clear, this metamorphosis into commodity is often incomplete. There is, let's say, a socialist remainder that renders the vocabulary of capitalism inadequate for the economics of post-Soviet ruins. In this talk, I will suggest that these trials of ruination enlist people into acts of constant improvisation. That is, the primary tactic for unlocking or forestalling salvage value is perpetual extemporization, doing things one never planned or was, ne or was never trained to do. What does it mean then to live a life extempore? Before the strictly discursive meanings of extemporization took hold, as in to extemporize, to speak off the cuff, there was an earlier sense of the term. In the 17th and 18th centuries, extempore, from the Latin extempore, literally meaning out of time, could refer to practices of everyday life. <clears throat> 
life extempore in this obsolete sense meant a life in which decisions are made in the moment in accordance with the needs of the present with little preparation. I want to dust off this anachronism and tinker with its semantic scope because I think with a little work, it can augment efforts to be more precise in anthropology's accounts of contemporary precarity. A life extempore is a life of precarity, but it's more than this. If precarity registers a state or condition of being in the world, extempore calls up a way of being in the world. While precarity is etymologically indifferent to temporality, the life extempore is one in which the capriciousness of time is decisive. Time is running out. Existence is out of step, not in its expected place in the prophesied progressive temporality of modern life. It is worth noting the nebulousness of the Latin root word tempus, which denotes both a singular moment and also time as a continuous concept. In this way, extempore here calls up both improvisational urgency in the moment and conditions of displacement from the protracted utopian timelines. A life extempore is a life nearly out of time, a life out of proper time, and an improvisational life. As we shall see, it is not a life without regard for the future, but one in which future plans are overcome by tactical adjustments in response to temporal troubles. Nor, by the way, is it a life without joys. Life extempore is an approach to securing gains in conditions of loss through considered inventiveness that is itself sustaining. Examining the trials of ruination underway inside Armenia's decommissioned Soviet factories requires looking with high archeological resolution at the improvisational practices through which extemporists revalue the anachronistic but persistent material world of Soviet industry, a massive accumulation of socialist things out of proper time. This work draws on more than three years living in Armenia, cumulatively since 1995, decades spent acquiring slow, accretive understanding of the post-Soviet condition, first in the field of political development, then in archeology, span and now as an archeological ethnographer. It is also based on two months of non-consecutive ethnographic fieldwork in 11 factories in various states of decomposition in the cities of Yerevan, Charensavan, Yumri, Ijevan, Vanadzor, Yeregnadzor, and Aparan. The study is also informed by unsystematic archeological surveys at dozens of abandoned uh, industrial sites. Today, I share only a very small part of this work using two case studies of extemporists in Yerevan and Yeregnazor. <clears throat> Before we turn to the factories, let me provide just a, a bit of historical context. In few republics of the Soviet Union was the process of industrialization more transformative than in Armenia. On the eve of the Bolshevik takeover, Armenia was largely an agrarian society. The period of dictatorial industrialization began under Stalin and continued through the Khrushchev era. Between 1928 and 1940, Armenia's industrial output increased almost ninefold, the third fastest rate in the USSR. An additional sixfold increase from 1940 to 1958 positioned Armenia as the fastest growing industrial economy in the USSR. In subsequent decades, Armenia continued to outpace most of the union. Heavy toxic industries predominated and included chemicals, polymers, precision instruments, electronics, construction materials, and mining of non-ferrous metals, especially copper, molybdenum, zinc, and gold. Light industries like textiles, processed foods, and cognac trailed far behind. Industry transformed urban centers like Leninakan and Yerevan and gave rise to new factory towns like Charensavan and Kirovagan. From the late Stalin through Khrushchev years, Armenia experienced the fastest rate of proletarianization in the USSR. Without discounting, discounting the role of socialist consumer culture in political subjectivization, in Armenia, as elsewhere, 
it was on the shop floor that the Communist Party produced, to quote Siegelbaum uh, and Sunni, an enthusiastic and heroic working class that became the mainstay of socialist construction. So what happened? Industrial ruination in Armenia evades neat causal explanation by recourse to singular terms like empire, modernity, socialism, capitalism, or natural disasters like earthquake. It is the result of all of these forces and more. It is tempting to place the weight of explanation on the inefficiencies of the planned economy and the dependencies Soviet planners created among the republics in their virtually unmitigated command over the accumulation and allocation of the means of production. Soviet collapse, the disappearance of coordination in Moscow and the redefinition of administrative borders into state borders severed the economic ties between newly independent republics, leading to what Stephanie Platz has called the cataclysmic paralysis of industry. Industrial paralysis decimated wage labor, but the material ruination of the factories was the work of other forces. Even before the Soviet collapse, seismicity had proved a singularly destructive agent. The Spitak earthquake not only reduced many factories to rubble, but also led to the shuttering of the Medzamor nuclear power plant, a precautionary measure taken in response to its location near a tectonic fault. The power plant's closure had ruinous knock-on effects. Cast into darkness for much of the 1990s, Armenians were left to scavenge for fuel. They turned not only to Armenia's scarce forest commons, but to the factories themselves. For example, in Gyumri, in the metal processing factory that I showed earlier, the director handed over wooden furniture and fixtures, the stage in the factory's cultural coup and pillars for a roof, to residents desperate for fuel. Earthquake and the geological distribution of fossil fuels are not shaped by Soviet designs, but economic planning intended to preclude self-reliance, the relegation of energy intensive industries in a fuel starved republic and the building of a nuclear power plant near an active seismic fault line are inseparable from Soviet machinations. And yet the deliberate large scale destruction of many Soviet factories is less easily explained in the contained frame of Soviet history. The proximal causes of rampant asset stripping included poorly regulated privatization and oligarchic corruption. In the scramble for Soviet spoils, the winners were the nomenklatura, the Soviet elite, including upper management of industries who were well positioned to purchase vouchers or coupons, COPEX on the ruble from factory employees desperate for cash, and then turn a quick profit on the wholesale gutting of assets. The inequities of the privatization process thus extended inequities that ran deep in late Soviet society. But in the 1990s, these inequalities were exacerbated by steeper disparities of wealth formed through the accumulation of industrial assets and by the unbridled pursuit of personal enrichment through the stripping and sale of heavy machinery, building materials, and scrap metal. These highly visible practices of enrichment, which left urban outskirts dotted with monstrous industrial carcasses, were only possible under the chaotic conditions of sudden market liberalization. To this day, the ability of a privileged few to profit off the collective assets of Armenia's former wage earners is perceived as a consummate betrayal of the nation at the very moment of its rebirth. This pursuit of wealth accumulation was made possible by an unregulated market, weak legal structure, and complicity between the private sector and government officials mired in graft. Market demand for decommissioned machinery was transnational and emerged primarily from Iran. In sum, large-scale industrial ruination resulted from systemic conditions that supported the extractive agency of the oligarchs. They percolated upwards from deep historical structures, just as they coalesced around new constellations of power and privilege. In my project, 
the large scale forces and heavy handed oligarchic practices of the piratical 1990s provide important historical backdrop, but brought to the fore are the lives extempore and the everyday trials of ruination that the 1990s left in their wake. To paraphrase Ann Stoller, I turn now to what our Armenians are doing with what they have been left with decades after the plunder of Soviet industry. In post-Soviet Armenia, ruins are almost always protected private property. An apparatus of locks, guards, walls, dogs, dogs that I'm getting to know, and fences formidably assert enclosure. While the livelihood practices underway in the factories can be read alongside ethnographies of reuse, the vigorous defense of property suggests that decaying factories are neither sites of waste nor abandonment, but represent a liminal property phase between use and discard. Only rarely do, owner, do owners relinquish ruins to the commons or permit, permit what Amiel Bizet calls gleaning. Supporting the apparatus of ownership is an emergent customary law of the ruins, which holds that there is no free pass into the enclosure. Access is inextricably linked to expectations for exchange. This forecloses scavenging as a means for capturing salvage value and instead demands structured transactions. Armenia's industrial landscapes are not so much sites of disorder, contra Tim Edensor, but of an order of a different kind. I learned these customary laws of the ruins from Chimik, or the chemist, as his friends call him. While Chimik has taught himself a great deal about chemistry, he is not, in fact, a chemist, nor is he a thief or a trash picker. Chimik lives a life extempore as a trader, money lender, and entrepreneur who specializes in extracting salvage value from chemical factories, one of the largest sectors of Soviet Armenia's economy. I go to work with Chimik. We meet at the Gordzaranayin or industrial metro at the southern outskirts of Yerevan and make our way through the industrial graveyard of the Shengavit district to one of its many chemical factories a place where Chimik enjoys unusually unfettered access. The factory, which I will call Chimzavod, although that's not its real name, once employed over 3,000 workers and produced chemicals for foods, perfumes, electronics, machines, and agriculture. Today, some buildings are stripped to their foundations, like the one you see here. Some are partially destroyed, their interiors exposed to the elements, and some remain intact, protected under lock and key, although I have been granted entry. The archeological co correlates of oligarchic asset stripping show themselves not only in the magnitude of destruction, but in what appear to be staging areas where heavy machinery like reactors and autoclaves and hoppers uh, are put on display for prospective buyers. On my first visit, we enter Himzavod from a back entrance. Chimik, who was looking to procure a flask, invited me to take photographs before we reached the dog and guard. He knows these ruins well. For over two decades, Chimik has made a living trading in laboratory supplies from factories like Himzavod, taking advantage of what Sergei Ushakin described as the late Soviet storage economy which emphasized stockpiling excessively large inventories. In the specialized world of the ruins economy, Chimik's particular expertise is glass. As we swip, sip unsweetened coffee with the guards in a gutted factory cafeteria, one of the men asks Chimik if he can help him find a good motor. If you want glass, I'll give you glass, Chimik replies. But what business do I have with motors? No one plans for a life lived off of ruins. Once a well-heeled money lender, and before that a worker in a hydroelectric plant, the chemist fell into this line of work in the late 1990s after a borrower defaulted. The debtor forfeited his collateral only disingenuously, 
according to Kimi, in the form of ostensibly dead assets from his recently privatized decommissioned chemical factory. The chemists turned to improvisation, finding ways to reap salvage value from the remnants. Realizing this, the owner blocked access to the factory, leaving Chimik to swallow his losses and ply his newfound trade as a broker of Soviet laboratory supplies. You have to support your family somehow, am I right? He asks me rhetorically. What began as petty trade, quote, buying and selling small unimportant things, he says, developed into transactions worth thousands of dollars. In our first meeting, the chemist handed me his business card, the phrase laboratory supplies prominently displayed against a backdrop of flasks. As a number of studies uh, focus on how practices of reuse engage a moral imperative to deliberately resist the excesses of consumer culture and develop alternatives to capitalist markets, Pimik alerts us to a countercurrent in which reuse provides the very means of entering and expanding the market. So how do you unlock the salvage value of glass? Archaeologists have long recognized the transparent solid as one of the most stable materials. Unlike scrap metal, whose salvage value is diminished by corrosion and the heavy costs of, uh, collecting, of collection and smelting, glass's durability limits depreciation. Glass products are also less susceptible to obsolescence than machinery. They have high reuse value. Chimik appreciates the timeless temporality of scientific glass. Here's the deal, he says at his home as we rummage through dusty storerooms, crammed floor to ceiling with chemical glassware. If you wash glass, it turns completely new again, he says. To unlock the salvage value of this millennia old material, the extemporist's first step is simply to wipe it. In a recent review of ethnographic engagements with reuse, Cindy Issenhower and Joshua Reno formulate reuse practices as a form of, quote, care work in which discarded broken things come to matter, quote, in terms of what they are composed of and what else they can be made to accomplish, close quote. The chemist earned his nickname not merely because of his unique expertise in buying and selling glass chemical supplies, but because he himself is an alchemist who puts untimely Soviet things to new uses. His magic is to assemble elaborate distilleries shown here that produce 100 proof vodka with nothing short of scientific precision using glass from the factories. <clears throat> Kimik storerooms contain instructional manuals that he also gathered, thinking, like any good bricoleur, that they may come in handy. <clears throat> in time, he used them to teach himself distillation. The chemist draws on the late Soviet do-it-yourself culture of extending the life cycle of material things to the extreme, which was not only a state-supported response to Soviet commodity deficit, but a process of subjectivization centered on making things with one's own hands. Chimik also extends the late Soviet practice of work, working for yourself, rabota nasibya, making and repairing things using factory resources. In so doing, he seems to derive the kind of sensory pleasure that Emma Widis has described of other practices of Soviet rukodelia, making things with one's own hands. Improvisational care work comes naturally to the former proletariat. Chimik is committed to realizing returns on the time and money invested in his contraptions, but he lacks the capital to move through the regulatory hoops for becoming a registered alcohol manufacturer. His work as a broker in Soviet glass is a means toward a more stable livelihood. After all, the factory glass will one day run out. The chemist facilitates the transit of Soviet-made glass into capitalist chains of production and consumption. His clients range from Armenia's leading enterprises like the Prosyan Brandy Factory to unknown end users working through other intermediaries. Now more than before, Chimi conducts business on the books, tells me. He takes pains to detail the taxes paid on transactions. <clears throat> 
In one case, for example, a client requested 20,000 test tubes, offering to pay 50 dirham per tube. Himi called his contacts across Armenia to confirm that he could fill the order. Factory owners agreed to sell the test tubes legally for 30 dirham each if, if Himi would shoulder the 5% sales tax they would have to pay. The tubes were transferred to the buyer who paid for them, but deducted the cost of 2000 tubes that unbeknownst, unbeknownst to Himik had broken in their packaging. Glass may be chemically stable, but it is not shock resistant. Having already paid the taxes on the full 20,000 test tubes, Himik suffered a loss. It is insufficient to relegate these exchanges conceptually to the ambiguous realm of the informal economy, even though they emerge from the most marginal spaces of Armenia's urban landscapes. This is not only because Chimik's transactions are now legal or because his kind of wageless life has been recognized as a feature of late capitalism for some time. Reducing the ruins economy to informality obscures its role in furthering capitalism's reach. As Anna Tsing writes, quote, sites for salvage are simultaneously inside and outside capitalism, close quote. While it is difficult to speak of what Tsing also calls salvage accumulation in relation to Armenia's Soviet ruins, Chimik's work is certainly comprehensible as a form of what she calls peri-capitalist practice. Like the Matsutake mushroom, mushroom pickers of Tsing's study, Chimik and others living a life extempore engage in alternative economic practices with untimely things in unplanned patches. Again, to quote Tsing, unplanned patches that nevertheless undergird capitalist growth. Like other middlemen, Chimik is a consummate translator, bringing salvage to capital. He and his associates also normalized the abnormalities of privatization by enabling the owners of defunct companies to pay property taxes. The transfiguration of a socialist factory into a supply depot or scrap metal mine is rendered business as usual. In short, unlike industrial ruins in the West, decommissioned Soviet factories are not places abandoned by capital's boom and bust cycles. Rather, they are sites of destruction off of which capitalism is parasitically feeding. Chimik's work is moreover inseparable from global commodity flows because salvage value in Armenia's ruins economy is premised fundamentally on the affordability of defunct Soviet things relative to their new equivalents on the world market. Success depends upon whether the forsaken remnants can stand up for substitution against capitalist commodities. The cunning evasion of market prices is key. <clears throat> in his storerooms, the chemist tells me, quote, I paid $100 for this, but in a shop, it would cost some 800 euros. Do you see this machine? The glass alone is worth 500 euros, but I gave only $300 for it. I gave $100 for this, but a new one in the store cost a million two hundred thousand dirham. During one winter visit to Himzavod, <clears throat> Chimik, the guard, and I were huddled before this wood-burning stove in an office that the guard has converted into his quarters. We were sharing a roasted chicken wrapped in lavash and Chimik's orange vodka when Chimik's phone rang. Hands greasy, he hit speakerphone. Can you help me fill an order for 600 meters of glass tubing like the ones we got from the factory in Yervart? asked the caller. Kimik hesitated, realizing that the quantity would require much foraging and negotiation. The caller explained that the deal was good because the buyers originally thought they needed to use costly quartz tubing from China, but were then convinced that Soviet glass could work. It sounds worth it, the chemist replied, accepting the job in the spur of the moment. <clears throat> Price has little to do with labor and investment or even with supply in the secondhand economy. Rather, price depends on personal relations and a judgment concerning the upper threshold of salvage value relative to the market value of new equivalents. Traders like Chimik harness the temporal displacement of Soviet things out of their proper time to help Armenian businesses minimize their exposure to global supply chains. In effect, he intercepts those supply chains. 
<clears throat> Sometimes it is possible to follow the persistent remnants along their unlikely itineraries out of the factories and into new chains of production. One of Chimik's business dealings was with a high-end company called Nyerion, a producer of all-natural, non-toxic, cruelty-free beauty pro products, selling $8 soap bars and related products in swanky Yerevan shops, an online store, and on Amazon, which, by the way, I highly recommend. They're wonderful. The company caters to Armenia's diaspora and nouveau riche. I visited the Nairian eco farm and laboratory facilities in the town of Araigyu to follow the biography of Chimik's glass. As we drove into the mountains of the Kotaik province, Nairian's co owner, Ara, explained that initially they considered locating their facility in a former chemical factory in Yerevan, but the plundered industrial zone was too abject for a beauty company. 90% of Nairion's equipment is sourced from old chemical factories. While still a startup, its scientists distilled essential oils using glass flasks purchased from the chemist, from Chimik. Those have since been replaced, but other equipment, such as autoclaves and vats from Chimzavod, are still in use, refitted to manufacture the company's serums, cleansers, and other wonderful products. A Soviet military-grade cauldron was modified for saponification. To estimate oil yields, plants are weighed on a heavy-duty scale of 1981 vintage. It is not simply the incongruity of signs entailed in the upcycling of toxic industries remnants into luxury goods and all natural products that holds my attention. What invi invites reflection here and in Chimik's other dealings is the incomplete shift, incomplete shift across different regimes of value, to quote Apaderai, that the Soviet things undergo in their metamorphosis into capitalist commodities. Now, this is not the space for an extended discussion of the Soviet commodity. Suffice it to harness Ushakin's analysis drawing on Das Kapital. In the situation of planned production and regulated prices and salaries, neither exchange value, the commodity's ability to generate different regimes of evaluation during its market circulation phase, nor even value, the aggregate expenditure of labor and material constituents, held any particular importance or interest. The Soviet commodity made itself known first and foremost as a material thing through its sensuous characteristics and consequently through its ability to meet or more commonly to fail the requirements of quality and functionality. Use value was paramount, not exchange value. Even as the remainders of socialist production become revalued within the logics of capital in a process akin to what Apadurai calls commodities by diversion, this transformation remains somehow incomplete. The sensuous characteristics still hold sway. This comes across plainly in the form of labor required to realize use value. Persistent Soviet things do not permit reuse precisely as they are. Resurrection requires improvisational care work. The resulting contraptions will be used to produce capitalist consumer goods, but they were never mass produced through abstract labor on an assembly line. They acquire an insistent singularity, to borrow Kapitov's term. In fact, one person in particular takes credit for refitting and operating the autoclave that you see on the left at Nairion, and that person is Chimik's son. He learned such care work from his father. Unlike capitalist commodity relations, far from being concealed, the social origins of such improvisational care work is transparent because it requires idiosyncrasy and individual creativity embedded in social relations. In Singh's terms, when it comes to Soviet salvage, capital does not entirely control the conditions of revaluation. In our last meeting, Chimik had a new plan for his vodka business. Instead of selling the spirit, he would invite customers to bring fruit from their gardens to distill their own vodka with his equipment evidently a business model with an easier licensing process. 
It has to happen this year if it's going to happen at all, he tells me. Time is running out. But he doesn't want to close any doors. Before we part ways, Pimik suggests that I partner with him in the vodka business and bring his product to the American market for a 50% cut. Quintessential extemporization. Psychologists have noted that a key hallmark of improvisation is openness to collaboration. The chemist knows I am not a business person, but when time is short, it can't hurt to try. A life extempore is one of constant creative adjustments and little time. In the trials of ruination, unlocking salvage value entails finding opportunity in the rupture of old dependencies and going toward the forsaken remnants, enlisting them into new entanglements with cunning and care work. Those who unlock salvage value assist the forces of decomposition. They facilitate the disassembly of old assemblages. But in the ruins economy, the life extempore also works in reverse, resisting the exchange of untimely things at all costs. Material care work takes many forms. In fact, it is fair to ask what is caring at all about disassembly, about taking things apart and pulling the pieces into new configurations, sacrificing the value of the whole for the value of the part, about foreclosing the prospect of new beginnings with old things. As archaeologist Ian Hodder notes, the care that humans show toward things with which they are locked in dependency can also be restorative, aimed at preserving things as they once were, and in turn, producing new formations. In this part of my talk, I turn to the dwindling society of late Soviet industrialists, former factory directors, now private owners, who work to realize wealth with dormant and dying assets. The precarity of their lives is quite unlike that of many dispossessed workers. It is also unlike the precarity of Armenia's refugee populations who live literally in the ruins in makeshift housing thrown up amidst the rubble of heavily stripped factories, which is another sort of stream of the project. Rather, theirs is the precarity of Eurasia's middle class, industrialists in remote towns whose livelihood is rendered uncertain by unfavorable economic conditions and a decaying material world that will not wait for better times. Here we look to the other side of the trials in which Chimik is bound up, to a factory owner who must decide what is to be done with the remnants of both socialism's and capitalism's failed promises. In Yereknadzor, a city in the Vyots Zor province, the owner of a knitting factory lives a life extempore that is dedicated to preserving his shuttered plant in order to one day restore wage labor. Founded in 1978, the Yeregnazor Knitting Factory exemplifies the unbounded reach of the Soviet military industrial complex. On the face of it, the factory specialized in children's knitwear and undergarments, 80% of which were exported throughout the Soviet bloc. But like so many Soviet concerns, the factory was dual purpose. Alongside children's sweaters and underwear, it produced gloves and socks for the Soviet army. It was, quote, a fundamental military enterprise, says Hike, the owner and former director. The production and distribution of gloves nicely exemplifies the workings of the Soviet economy. Each day, 20 tons of fabric for the gloves reach Yeregnadzor from, from a factory in the Ural Mountains. Every third day, a 20 ton container of gloves was shipped by train to a military facility in Moscow where the gloves were redistributed to defense units across the country. According to Hike, this was the only factory in the USSR that made gloves for the Ministry of Defense. The enterprise employed some uh, 1,200 women in its main factory and three affiliate branches in nearby wool producing villages. The factory continued to operate as a public enterprise through the dark years of the 1990s when Hike took to the forests to gather timber to heat it. By that point, workers were hand knitting wool socks for Armenian forces in the war with Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh. 
Five days after the factory's privatization in 1998, Hike became embroiled in a legal dispute. The State Revenue Committee sued the company on charges of tax evasion, despite the fact that it had successfully filed for bankruptcy and had scarcely any debts. Five years later, the court decided in the company's favor, but the State Revenue Committee refused to accept the judgment. Tax authorities froze the factory's assets, imposed steep arbitrary fines, and sequestered 30 machines. They wanted to steal, Hike says, take the machines and sell them in Iran. There were many more lawsuits and hundreds of court proceedings. For years, the factory lay dormant, its machines creeping toward obsolescence. Hike spent over two decades fighting for the future of the factory. He sold his home and barely managed to put his kids through college. Quote, the word court was a synonym for bribe, he tells me. Tax authorities would just hand over money to judges and the most illegal decisions would be made. The ordeal ended following Armenia's Velvet Revolution in 2018, which led to sweeping anti-corruption efforts. A judge ruled that much of the State Revenue Committee's case was unfounded. All that remains is a reduced $10,000 debt. Hyde contests even this and is angry that he wasn't compensated for 20 years of lost time. He intends to take the case to the European Court of Human Rights, but Hyde worries that time is not on his side. And if he doesn't pay soon, quote, they'll come and take my machines, maybe in one month. His trial of ruination is as much a legal as a material struggle. As tax authorities held the factory hostage, its preservation and eventual revitalization became the focus of Hike's life's work. The Yeregnadzor knitting factory is a fossil of late Soviet light industry and emphatically not a ruin. As Hike tells it, for the most part, the communists left, and since then, not a thing here has been touched. On the contrary, he has invested significant savings into preserving the factory's use value. For instance, installing a new roof so that the hibernating machines would not succumb to water damage and regularly rep replacing broken windows. The machines may be rusty, antiquated, and coated in dust, he acknowledges, but they work and could be put to use until he has the capital to buy the latest equipment. He has installed locks and comes to the factory, quote, morning, noon, and night to guard the structure. Hike is deeply critical of the orgies of plunder that defined the 1990s and were inseparable from notoriously corrupt governments. He witnessed events that many have recounted, but are virtually absent in the media archive of those years. Yeregh Nazor is on the road between Yerevan and Iran, and we saw it with our own eyes all day, all night, beginning in 1994 and 1995. I would watch them hauling such great machines that being an engineer and understanding what they were, I would think if only just one of those machines were mine. Out in the wide open, there were some machines that the Iranians didn't even put to use. Someone I know went to Iran, said there are all these Soviet machines piled up like a haystack in a desolate field near a certain metro. They've been picked apart. There was gold, silver, mercury, valuable metals in those machines. They separated the steel, the cast iron, the colorful metals. They took the machines from Armenia for measly kopecks, the scrap metal they sell to Turkey or Pakistan for $200, $300 per ton. For Hike, the government-backed wholesale stripping of the country's assets and the unfortunate fate of his own factory, targeted by officials seeking to grab the salvage value of its knitting machines, are inseparable. Together, they attest to inten intentionally destructive governance. Speaking of Armenia's three post-Soviet prime ministers, he says, when independence and Levon Terpetrosyan came, they thought, let's see how quickly we can destroy this country. The sooner we destroy, the sooner we will build. They destroyed quickly, but they forgot all about building. Levon destroyed it, Kocharyan ruined it, Serge completely privatized it to himself, close quote. Such searing resentment is unanimous among the extemporists with whom I speak. Far from abetting the salvage economy, Hayek has struggled to resist it. He wants to put the machines and the operators back to work. An Iranian came wanting to buy one of my spinning machines. I said, no, if I can close the debt, I will rescue those 30 machines. If not, his voice trails off. 
Hayek seems to in inhabit a state of what Lauren Berland calls cruel optimism, the condition of maintaining an attachment to a problematic object in advance of its loss. In the climate of hope that swept the country following the Velvet Revolution, Hayek seized the moment. Days after the revolution, he sent letters to the new prime minister, the director of the National Security Service, the Minister of Justice, and the human rights defender. Months later, he mobilized a group of people from Yeregnazor to protest in the capital, demanding the reopening of the factory. Unlike most privatized enterprises, the knitting factory is an open joint stock company. Former employees, quote, now grandmothers, Hike says with fondness, retain shares in the business. There are over 309 owners of this privatized enterprise, 95% of whom are the women who worked here, Hike notes. Many in Yeregnazor are personally invested in Hike's cause. He promises the return of 300 jobs if the factory reopens and speaks passionately about industry as the means toward national self-sufficiency. We should make what we need to dress ourselves. Did you see the words on the side of the building? One letter has fallen, but the rest are there. It says, glory to work. Mobilizing the community around a message of wage labor reveals how extemporization can sometimes exert real sociopolitical effects. But activism was only his most recent act of extemporization. While Hike waited for his factory, he decided to launch a new business venture manufacturing oak wood barrels to make wine and brandy. The forests of his home province are rich in oak and he has the necessary technical skills. Hyde worked in a factory that made satellite parts before coming to the knitting factory. As scholars of improvisation have long recognized, extemporization entails, quote, a union of some ad hocery with some know-how and the pitting of an acquired competence or skill against an unprogrammed opportunity." Close quote. While the legal dispute stretched on, Pike built a structure on the grounds of the knitting factory and assembled a stunning array of apparatuses like the one on the left to make barrels using Soviet machines otherwise destined for the foundry, as well as an assortment of other contraption, contraptions, a machine for, she for shelling sunflower seeds that he will use to distill sunflower oil, a machine for pressing lumber waste into bricks that can be used as firewood and so forth. Quote, there is no useless metal, he tells me, only useless people. For extemporists like Haig, the obsolescence of a machinic order is not the end, but the beginning of opportunity. The profits from the barrel business are invested in the upkeep of the, de of the decaying factory. At some point along the way, Haig grasped the desires of the ruins gaze and decided to try his hand at what Karen Barnt has called the quote, culturalization of industrial ruins turning the suspended factory into an unofficial museum and tourist destination. On my first visit to the knitting factory, he gave me a guided tour. Turn on your voice recorder and we'll begin, he said. In the dusty decaying building, Hyde pauses to offer brief recitations about different objects. Here is a Zinger sewing machine made in Nazi Germany. Here are locked workers saves. The owners died, but I haven't cut the locks. This machine is nearly a hundred years old and it still works. These are our gas, ma gas masks in case of chemical attack. See on the top right. Hike's improvisational curatorial uh, practice caters to the ruins tourists, the ruins tourists taste for the sensational, the bizarre, the authentic. Quote, if someone was a spy in the Soviet Union, whether in Vladivostok or Kaliningrad, for sure they were wearing my gloves. When we arrive at a room that stores wool socks made for the war effort, he offers me a pair as a souvenir. They're, they're very warm. The tour culminates in the director's office where an assemblage of high impact artifacts is brought together into an improvised exhibition. Lenin's portrait, a volume from Lenin's collected works, Russian and Armenian typewriters, a gas mask, a Geiger counter, a device for identifying chemical attack by mustard gas, phosgene, et cetera, 
and an unfurled workers banner, the so-called transferable red banner awarded to factory collectives each year for high performance in fulfilling the plan in a, in a socialist competition. On another table, samples of the factory's products, including the spy gloves, are displayed with artifact labels indicating year of manufacture. I ask Haig how many visitors have come to the factory. Many, he replies, hundreds, thousands. He claims that the site appears on online tourist itineraries as a, quote, preserved Soviet enterprise, but I haven't been able to find it. Hayek says, quote, the factory is a museum now, but as an unregistered heritage institution, it might be more accurate to call it a museological extemporization. Hayek seems to affirm Berlant's point that optimism is cruel when, quote, the very pleasures of being inside a relation have become sustaining regardless of the content of the relation, such that a person or a world finds itself bound to a situation of profound threat that is at the same time profoundly confirming. It was in the director's office that I began to understand the relationship between Hayek's curatorial sensibility and the trial of ruination in which he is engaged. On the director's desk, he has arrayed a seemingly incongruous assortment of objects shoes worn by factory workers, the building's intercar, I'm not shown in this photo, blank union cards, you can see a bit of one at the top of the screen, one of which he gave to me. These artifacts uh, in the foreground, there are two old bars of silk. These artifacts were perfectly commensurate with the room's other museological displays, but placed beside them were unrelated documents that attest to his business ventures and credentials, such as brochures advertising the oak barrels, and certificates from business trainings he attended in the United States and Europe. In other words, Hike plays with the idiom of heritage tourism, heritage tourism not as a rev revenue generator in itself, he does not charge for entry, but to attract investors for the revitalization of the knitting factory. Museological extemporization is an improvised business model deployed in response to the forces of ruination, legal and material. Hike reasons that any given visitor might be the one who joins him in this struggle. Before I depart, he hands me a one page trilingual inform informational document that reads, business invitation to Armenia. Taron OJSC invites partner investors on mutually profitable terms for the production of textiles, clothes, handmade carpets, jams, juices, marmalades, teas, dried fruit, fruit vodka. Hike asks me to give it to whomever I can back in America. When I respond that as a researcher, business is outside my sphere of expertise, he seems bewildered by the rigid box I inhabit. And he laughs in gentle reproach as if to say, can't you extemporize? Okay, just a few concluding remarks uh, that gesture to some of the broader um, uh, themes of the project. The recent turn to ruins in archaeology, anthropology, and cultural geography has attended compellingly to the critique of the modernist experiment. Some look to ruination expressly to expose the devastation left in the wake of imperial and state projects. Here I'm thinking of Gordillo and Stoller and Gonzalez Rubal. Others look to places of ruin as small reserves where non-progressive heterogeneous temporalities and experiences of urban life alternative to the oppressive logics of capital are shown or imagined to be possible. Here I'm thinking of Shannon Doughty and Tim Edensor's work. Many of these projects descend more or less directly from Walter Benjamin's effort to wake us from the mythic dreamscape of industrial culture, mechanization and the commodity fetish, to expose modernity's temporal ideology of progress and its inherent destructiveness. But the turn to ruins has yet to attend to the improvisational efforts of those who live off the remnants of the modernist dreamscape. Looking to ruins to make visible the pernicious face of industrial modernity or to defiantly expose its limits leaves us without the conceptual resources to see the survival strategies of lives out of proper time. One final point. A profound ethical tension permeates the life extempore and decommissioned Soviet factories. On the one hand, the economic ad hocism of people like Chimik, who upcycle industrial remnants made available by poorly regulated schemes of privatization, 
that disenfranchised millions of Armenians advances environmental imperatives to reduce industrial production and reuse the remnants of 20th century excess, however inadvertently. On the other hand, the work of people like Haik, who resist the disassembly of industrial modernity's behemoth assemblage and turn to political activism to restore wage labor, threaten a return to an industrial order that was environmentally ruinous. The trials of ruination defy straightforward moral claims. But what is clear is that the life extempore is not a life of freedom, as is often associated with artistic improvisational practice. For all its inventiveness, it is less empowering than forced by extreme structural constraints. To paraphrase Goher's analysis of Nietzsche on improvisation, the life extempore is lived on a post-Soviet tightrope, quote, with and between joy and suffering, affirmation and doubt, experimentation and habit. And as in all trials, during trials of ruination, outcomes remain open-ended. The horizon of possibilities includes dystopian endings, inventive reimaginings, and stasis. And as in all trials, justice may yet be served for the depredations that precipitated adversity in the ruins. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laurie, for this wonderful, wonderful talk. It's fascinating. And I feel like I have a million questions and I could talk to you about this for many, many hours. Um, I want to encourage our audience to um, write their questions into the Q&A. You can find that little tiny button on the bottom of your screen. And uh, I'm sure you have lots of things to, to think about here. Um, I, I, have, I, I want to start first with asking you a little bit about your uh, scholarly trajectory. Looking at your earlier work, you are someone who's deeply, deeply rooted in archaeology and the materiality of excavation and curation and, and so on. How, how did you become interested in in this particular project, which seems to be quite different from what you have done earlier? Thank you, Molly. It's a great question. So the truth is that it's very hard to practice archaeology in Armenia as a kind of traditional excavating archaeologist without seeing at every turn the remnants of another empire. So as you, you know, as you noted earlier, my first project was on the archaeology of the Persian Empire and belongs to a kind of larger interest in how archaeologists study empire. So it's with that gaze that um, that project was undertaken. And uh, indeed, you know, the, the remnants of the Soviet Empire are all around you on the landscape when you're working in, in even sort of traditional modes of archaeological practice. And so uh, and that coupled with um, an earlier <laughs> an earlier life as a, um, a student of Soviet and post-Soviet politics and an earlier career in political development, I, perhaps I was especially attuned to uh, these material remnants of modern empire. So there is a thematic link, even though it mm -hmm. traverses you know, millennia, there is a, 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 a thematic link between the two projects in the interest in empire and its remnants, empire and its materiality. Uh, I should also say that um, may not be familiar to most in our audience today, but there is also an emerging field of archaeological inquiry called the archaeology of the contemporary past sometimes or the archaeology of uh, the recent past that is beginning to look upon the 20th century as already open to the archaeological gaze. And this can take the methods of contemporary archaeology can include excavation. That's not something I'm doing in this project. It can include survey. It can include many of the methods that are uh, familiar to archaeology. Uh, so this fits also within squarely within um, that sort of new and emerging and exciting, really exciting movement in, in archaeology. It's a it's a very exciting work, I, I must say. Um, there is there's a question from from the audience um, that's uh, asking you uh, first of all whether or not you have published yet. I think I know the answer to that. Um, uh, but the other question is: um, Did you catalog these eleven factories, their contacts, specializations, and um, expressing their their thanks for this awesome presentation? 
Thanks for that question. So uh, the answer to the first question is not yet. Um, the paper that I shared with you today uh, recently underwent peer review with the journal Col uh, Cultural Anthropology, and I hope to revise it shortly and hope to see it appear in that journal in the, in the year ahead. Um, and yes, in response to the second question, I have a very <laughs> elaborate uh, catalog and system for recording um, Again, as I said at the start, this, these two case studies that I presented are just a small fraction of the larger project. And so the, there is uh, indeed a, um, a database that contains um, a host of information pertinent to the project. It's, which, uh, which brings me to thinking a little bit about the larger context of your project. You hinted at this in, in your talk, and so I want to pick up on that. Um, you also talk about people who inhabit these spaces. So you talked a lot about interpre entrepreneurs in this particular moment, but who are the people who are inhabiting these places? How, uh, how are they uh, modifying and how are they engaging with that physical environment? Uh, and especially, I, I guess, you know, just thinking about also the contemporary conflict is that yet another one of those moments where these factories may or may not become the homes of refugees. Indeed, I've been thinking a lot about that. So um, from my field work, um, refugees and um, so refugees from, from the first Karabakh war, um, and also especially in the north in the Gyumri and Vanazar area, refugees from the earthquake, live in makeshift housing, uh, either on the grounds of some of the factories, particularly in Vanazor or in Gyumri, um, there's been sort of adaptive reuse, you know, taking um, factories or usually it's the administrative buildings rather than the actual plants that have been uh, adapted into um, into mm. apartment spaces, and so um, I I mean uh, one can imagine that um, with the influx of some ninety thousand or more refugees coming now from Artsakh, some of these spaces may indeed uh, accommodate those populations. There mm -hmm. there is the space, but it does require um, rebuilding. So there is another question from the audience, um, from Alyssa. Uh, she said it was so engrossing. I'm uh, curious if anyone from the international development NGO sector has been trying to capitalize on the creative creativity of these extemporizers and what effects, oops, I lost the, I the see question. Uh -huh. You see it? What yeah. effects that might have on the ruins? Um, Alyssa, that's an interesting question. Not, I, not NGOs. Well, I will say, so um, there are different ways in which people interact with these spaces. And I focus today on the economics of it and on these two extemporists. But there's also a kind of emerging contemporary art scene in Armenia that to some degree is also thinking about creative ways to engage with issues of memory and materiality. And so for instance, um, there was a, um, an artistic uh, uh, art practice in Ijevan that worked with an electronics factory and, and did some interesting work there. And uh, the Yeraz um, car factory or van factory is the site of a Yerevan art expo. So not so much international NGOs, but it, it is worth pointing out that there are different forms of engagement, including local artists who are, you know, just beginning to think about um, not just beginning there some of those efforts are from the uh, from earlier in the 2000s um, but i would say it's a small segment of the art scene that is trying to think about the kind of issues of nostalgia memory and materiality with the soviet past and the industrial past finally in terms of another form of reuse that doesn't come didn't come up today uh, there is some adaptive reuse on the part of businesses um, and in particular uh, one one of my field sites is an um, electronics factory in yerevan uh, near Kino Rasia, one of the largest electronics factories in Yerevan that has been beautifully renovated and um, adapted into an IT workspace. And that's one of the few examples um, that I would say of a pattern that we see in Europe and the United States and other areas of converting industrial uh, ruins into business, new business ventures. Mm 
That's really interesting that you're saying this because when when you were talking, um, I of course what came to mind living in living in Michigan, <laughs> also but also living living in uh, you know near the city of Detroit and you know this sort of um, artistic uh, uh, fascination with with what has been called ruin porn. And so that has sort of throughout because I also am very intrigued by your images and your photography, which is really incredible. And it has sort of throughout the talk, I've always I thought about this this idea of ruin porn and whether or not there is um, much of that going on. So you hint at it that there is a little bit, but how about international people? I'm thinking of the work also of Ursula Schulz Dornberg, who came to Armenia and uh, took pictures of um, old bus stations that became yeah. an exhibit here in Germany. Yeah. Uh, there was um, one um, Venice Biennale exhibit years ago that a photographer whose name escapes me at the moment uh, participated in that included photographs from Armenia. And one of the things that I liked about that um, particular art project was that while it was part of the ruins porn kind of um, movement that I myself am quite uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, his photographs always included people, and that's something that I try to do as much as I can as well. Um, I grapple with um, the photographic and affective and aesthetic display of this work, and mm -hmm. in some iterations, of sort of uh, really uh, choose not to show. Fo it's difficult. Um, it's difficult because mm -hmm. they are evocative and they are yeah. arresting. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's important that they be kind of, um, you know, uh, shrouded or, or that they be um, contextualized yes. in, in the context of the, the real lives that take place amidst them. So, yeah, 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 yeah. And you did that beautifully, I must say. You know, it wasn't that they were standing by themselves to have this affective uh, relationship, but they were ob obviously deeply situated within your work. Um, so Ron Suni says, thank you for this fascinating talk. I want to ask about the affective re registers of these spaces, which seem to be spaces often largely empty of humans. What stories are told about those spaces? Are there any stories of hauntings and ghosts? Oh, how fascinating. What a great, great that question. That is a great question, Ron. <laughs> it's a great question, Ron, also because in Tim Edensor's work in British, in factories in Britain, he talks about hauntings and ghosts. So that's part of the discourse in the study of ruins. I haven't encountered that particular affective register. I will note uh, just a two things, a, a few points on uh, uh, pertinent to this question. First of all, the the extemporists, the people that you heard about today, they are not they are not nostalgic. They don't talk nostalgically so much about the past. They, searing resentment, yes. Anger at corruption and the privatization process, yes. But quite unlike other sort of sites of ruination, or at least the ways in which scholars and cultural critics often approach ruination, nostalgia is not an affective register really that I'm encountering all that much. That said, there's a whole nother story to be told that uh, is part of this fieldwork, um, where when you speak to former workers who've been dispossessed um, and live immediately around uh, these, these ruins, there, there is very intense anger. There is very intense resentment. I'm um, thinking in particular, there's a Masi Kombinat, a, a meat combinat in Gyumri that was one of the biggest meat combinats in the Soviet Union, the biggest in the Caucasus. And it has it is just a dystopian landscape. It has been stripped and 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 it's and it's ongoing. The kind of gutting of this site is ongoing. And there are people, former workers, women and men who live immediately around this ruinous landscape. And speaking to them is affectively very different. It's not ghosts and haunting. It's what have they done? You know, it's anger, it's resentment, it's about loss of wage labor. Um, so, uh, not a lot of romance, not a lot of romanticism, which is otherwise such a pervasive kind of theme in the ruins literature. So the question actually was from Anush, oh, so hi, not, Anush. From, not, not, not from Ron, who probably would have asked you about the portrait of Lenin, <laughs> <laughs> rather than the effect of uh, haunting qualities of these Thanks spaces. Thanks for the question, Anush. <laughs> it was a really great question. Uh, and she has a second question. Um, and she says, I love the discussion of heritage tourism. And this project also reminds me of David Kazanjian's work 
on ruin lust and the diasporic flannery in Armenia. Can you speak a bit more about how the diasporan Armenians interact with these spaces and with the local Armenians who live and work amongst them? I'm writing that down because I'm not familiar with Davi's work. So of course I will. Oh, yeah. um, Anush, I think I'm the only diasporan Armenian who says this. <laughs> no, um, I, I, um, they're off. They're off the map. They're off the tour. You know, there's not yet a kind of dark tourism industry to speak of. Although I've heard that there have been some efforts in that uh, direction in Vanazor in particular. But um, I, I, there have been, as I said, contemporary artists, including a diasporan sort of diasporan Armenian uh, curator and uh, photographer, who's organized exhibits on photographic exhibits on industrial ruins. But by and large, there, this, these spaces are very marginal, obviously, and they're, they're not yet institutionalized as part of Armenia's heritage apparatus. And the reasons for that are, are not so difficult to sort of think through, right? I mean, this is not about an, a national heritage. This is about a, a, a modernist proletariat heritage that is not all that different from what we would likely find in almost any corner of the Soviet Union. So. Um, uh, it's not easily folded into a heritage apparatus that is otherwise very firmly centered on the nation. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting also, I mean, if we're thinking about this, this gentleman who's basically made a museum out of his, his factory, I mean, that's, that's one attempt, but who is visiting, Who's, who would be visiting that, that museum, quote unquote? Actually, they are. He does speak of, of foreigners who photographer. Yeah, I mean, others with interest in ruins. And I frankly, I do not know how they find him because I've searched high and low for a website that he speaks of. Um, I'm not sure, but he has he, he, he speaks of European tourists with interest in ruins who, who come to take photographs. Um, and I suppose they all receive the flyer and the invitation. Uh, to become business partners, but um, this is all at the you know at the margins of this um, economy and of this um, heritage culture. So it, it's really fascinating the customary law that you mentioned in the very beginning that once you enter this space, something will be asked of you, and and you've obviously also mentioned what has been asked of you every time you enter, and how does one respond to this interaction that you are now be asked to us to become an entrepreneur in in these business ventures. This, this customary know. law is is one of the most interesting and in some ways challenging. It raises interesting ethical challenges because, yeah. I mean, I was lucky through various contexts to find my way to, to Chimik, but I can't go into any, any factory um, without offering something, which of course, so therefore that really limits because I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to offer to purchase <laughs> uh, flasks or whatever else. So my access is constrained and regulated by my own research is regulated by these customary laws of the ruins. Um, and then you might bring this, this disappointment in the end, right? You're having this conversation with, with, with these men and um, they're, you know, uh, sort of uh, grooming you almost to become their business partner, perhaps in the end. And then the answer will be, will be no. I mean, <laughs> well, I've just advertised it to all of you, if you wish. The IRB process, the IRB process and the consent process ostensibly is intended to, yeah. uh, you know, bring transparency to the transaction. And of course, from the very start, consent and, you know, is part of my, my work, but yes, indeed, it's, 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 it's clearly uh, understood in, in different ways and um, nevertheless e leads to interesting uh, oppositions. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Um, so Eric has a question. He says, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union and takeover of the ownership of the factories and selling the equipment and materials, is there a monetary figure of these, econo of these economics? Um, so I, I can't put a price tag. What I can say is that heavy industry um, and light industry are, are two very different worlds in terms of the, um, the monetary structure, right? And that, um, you know, there's a local Armenian metal scrap um, market for, for scrap metal, I should say. And then there's the international and transnational movement of these equipments that, uh, you know, many will say that the 
um, you know, oligarchs of, of the first few governments essentially gained all of their, um, their enrichment off of these, off of these factories. So that's, we're talking about in that, in that case, especially heavy industry, very significant sums. Indeed, um, <clears throat> uh, um, there's a, a WikiLeak um, release about um, the movement of, of supplies, the, 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 the um, hypothesized movement of supplies from chemical factories to Iran in support of Iran's nuclear weapons program. So, you know, obviously that chain is a little difficult to research, um, but it, so it ranges from, you know, high level governmental transactions or uh, oligarchic transactions to petty, what we can call more petty trade in the order of the magnitude of like the thousands with which someone like Himi, you know, uh, takes care of his family. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so, so very much. Um, uh, I think we're almost out of time. And um, I wanted to, again, thank you so very much, Lori, for this really fascinating talk. And I hope very, very much that we will welcome you in person at Michigan at your alma mater soon and uh, engage much more with, with your work, which is just really, really fascinating, I must say. And for those of you in the audience, I hope that you will be joining us for our next webinar on November 18th by Zolin Nalbadian, who is going to talk about the Lebanonization of Armenian. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much and good evening to everyone.